Hello and welcome. I'm Scarlett Worth, the program chair for the National Railway Historical Society's Washington, D.C. chapter. Our mission is to expand the public appreciation of railroads and their history through preservation and education. One of the ways that we do this is through free public programs. Our program tonight is the East Broadtop Railroad, then and now. As early as 1964, the EBT was designated a National Historic Landmark. Since that time, preservation of the EBT has been a top concern of the Railroad Heritage and Preservation community. The EBT has been described as an incomparable national treasure, comprising a site, a set of historic buildings and facilities, a community, and a spirit that taken together are unique in this country. According to a study published in 1990 by America's Industrial Heritage Project, the East Broadtop system, complete with railroad facilities, associated industries, is probably the only opportunity in the nation to tell a comprehensive railroad industry story. This past February 2020, preservation of the East Broadtop took a major leap forward when the railroad was sold to the newly formed East Broadtop Foundation. In the five months since that time, the Foundation and the Friends of the East Broadtop have accomplished miracles. This two-part program features a panel of speakers who will share their insider knowledge about the East Broadtop Railroad's history, preservation, and future. We'll begin part one of the program with a short video clip of the East Broadtop's machine shop in operation, which is possible due to the Friends of the East Broadtop and the Railroad working together over the years. I hear that compressor kick off. Yeah. Where's the jump jump coming out at? Right under your feet. I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, Andy Van Syok, president of the Friends of the East Broadtop, a group that has kept the faith, providing hands-on restoration and financial support for the East Broadtop preservation since 1983. Andy will present an overview and history of the East Broadtop. Good evening. Thank you, Scarlett. Uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, I'm excited to be here, especially with Brad and Lawrence accompanying me. Uh, I'm excited to share with you the East Broadtop Railroad. Uh, it, uh, is a home to me. Uh, many folks might say it's a second home, but in reality, uh, at times it probably competes with my actual home. So, uh, but it, uh, I grew up around the railroad, uh, volunteering there uh, even as a child, uh, and uh, volunteer now with the uh, Friends of East Broadtop, and I'm excited to share that with you tonight. Uh, so, as we go through this evening, we'll uh, kind of have three segments. Uh, the first segment will cover background and history a little bit. Uh, it'll be a very abridged history, but we'll move through that pretty quickly. Second is what the Friends of the East Broadtop have been doing for the past 20 years and a little bit about the organization as a whole. And then about the EBT Foundation. We'll pull in Brad and Lawrence into that conversation and uh, they can tell us everything they've been doing. We can ask questions uh, and have a good exchange. So a little bit about the railroad. Let's uh, first kind of explain where it is. It's in the middle of Pennsylvania, South Central Pennsylvania. There you can see the arrow. Uh, and there's three main coal regions in Pennsylvania, the Northeastern uh, Anthracite region, and to the western part of the state, you have uh, bituminous uh, coal regions. And in the middle, you have semi-bituminous, and that's where the broad top coal field is. So for uh, many of you, you understand it's a little bit south of uh, State College, uh, and it connects to the Pennsylvania Railroad at uh, Mount Union, which you can see at the north end of this map. Uh, and uh, for those of you who know the Pennsylvania Railroad, it's about 90 miles west of Harrisburg on the uh, middle division of the Pennsylvania Railroad. The uh, East Broadtop was in its uh, uh, greatest extent, 33 mile main line from Mount Union all the way down to uh, Alvin and Woodvale over at the lower left uh, corner. And with some uh, extensive branches, the Shade Gap branch being the longest out to Neolithin through Shade Gap, 
uh, the Jawler branch and some other little branches here and there uh, that were formed over the years. And just to give you a little bit more context, Fort Littleton there at the very bottom of this map is actually a Pennsylvania Turnpike exit, uh, if that helps frame it for you. So let's start uh, with the history of the railroad. Uh, a lot of people, like I, you know, started out there, talk about coal when you talk about the East Broad Top, but really the railroad was first created to support the iron industry. Uh, as you can see in this map, 1858, there was quite an array of forges and uh, furnaces in the region, in the Juniata region. Uh, and these uh, had been working, many of these uh, dated back even 100 years uh, or more by this point. And so in 1856, the East Broad Top Railroad was chartered uh, to help support the iron industry. However, Civil War, uh, economic downturns and whatnot kind of prevented the building of the railroad at that point. So about 20 years later, in the early 1870s, uh, a new consortium came to town with economic uh, prosperity, new uh, prosperity in the 1870s, and started building the railroad to support their enlarged Rock Hill Iron Furnace. So you can see, essentially, the uh, uh, railroad was built as a conveyor belt system uh, to serve the iron furnace. So from the right-hand side there and some of the green uh, air highlighted areas to the south were iron ore pits. Uh, ore was brought in. Limestone came from uh, some quarries uh, and all came to Rock Hill Furnace there to serve the furnace, feed the furnace. Uh, and then finished iron, uh, iron pigs left on the railroad to, uh, to travel uh, to customers all around. Uh, this is a good picture of the uh, iron furnace that was in Rock Hill. Uh, this uh, we'll show you a little later, but this is essentially uh, to the east and slightly south of where the trolley museum tracks are in the uh, shops. It's uh, sort of behind the uh, Orbizonia yard that most of you may be familiar with. Uh, in the 1870s, as many of you may know, uh, railroads uh, were going through a craze, new railroads at that time, especially in mountainous territories uh, where curves were sharp uh, and to keep costs down were built to narrow gauge standards. Instead of being four foot eight and a half inch uh, track. It was now uh, for the East Broadtop and uh, several others. They used three foot, by far the most common narrow gauge. Uh, but as I said, it was lighter, uh, less expensive to build, and uh, uh, permitted sharper curves. And so it fit the region quite well. So now we get into coal. Uh, as the iron industry, especially the small sort of mom and pop family iron shops, closed down with uh, the uh, increase in things like United States Steel and uh, Carnegie Steel and whatnot, uh, early in the 20th century, those small iron furnaces shut down. And so the East Broadtop changed focus from being coal to the furnace to being coal to outside customers and became their primary commodity just to haul coal from the mines, uh, which you can see here to the left side there in the Robertsdale area. Uh, there were a number of coal mines served by the East Broadtop on the east side of the Broadtop region. And uh, Coal became the primary commodity uh, after about 1910 and uh, reaching a peak year of 1926 when uh, almost 750,000 tons of coal were mined on the broad top and brought down by the East Broad Top Railroad to Mount Union. So transferring that coal, where did that coal go if the East Broad Top just went to Mount Union? Well, there are several different customers, local customers, of course, but a lot of that coal was transferred to Pennsylvania Railroad standard gauge hoppers. Early on in these pictures, you can see transferred from the wood cars by a trestle means essentially and just gravity feed into the uh, standard gauge hoppers. The next slide shows where uh, in later years, they uh, became uh, much more advanced and uh, built a cleaning plant essentially. So coal as it comes out of the ground, of course, is impure. Uh, and then you can filter it to different sizes, different grades. And so uh, as part of the necessary transfer process, they built the coal cleaning plant in Mount Union. So as the coal was transferred from narrow gauge to standard gauge, it was also filtered, sorted, and uh, screened uh, to be different grades for what different customer needs uh, they had. And then of course shipped out. So then one of the biggest uh, local customers for that coal was actually the brick plants. Mount Union became uh, Bricktown USA, uh, as some called it, uh, with three major uh, brick manufacturers in town, Harbison Walker, uh, General Refractories and North American Refractories, sometimes referred to as Narco. Uh, and these brick plants were enormous and employed uh, a tremendous amount of folks in town, but they also burned a tremendous amount of coal for the kilns. 
the other reason these brick plants were there, and they made something called refractory brick, which actually served their former competitors, the steel mills. Uh, refractory brick is lined to uh, used to line uh, blast furnaces and other steel making uh, uh, apparatus. Uh, and so this uh, refractory brick required large quantities of ganister rock. As you can see in the picture on the right, it's a very white rock that is very prevalent, particularly on Jack's Mountain, uh, just on sort of the west side, and then also some to the east of the uh, Ogwick Valley, uh, as you can see by the green circles highlighting on the map there where the uh, quarries were. So those were the three primary commodities. The East Broadtop certainly uh, had some other commodities. There was McKelvey logging that uh, did some timbering operations for a period of time. There were uh, certainly tanneries as well, uh, and some other smaller industries in the area that uh, the East Broadtop served over time. But uh, iron, then coal, and brick uh, manufacturing were the primary three commodities that the railroad served. Of course, it was the lifeline for all the small towns uh, along the line too. So it certainly hauled general commodities, uh, everything from chewing gum to pianos, anything that uh, was needed in the local region. So let me give you a real quick tour of the original East Broadtop of the 33 miles. We'll start in Mount Union at the north end of the map where it connected to the standard gauge Pennsylvania Railroad. And of course that yard in Mount Union was a lot of dual gauge trackage for that interface and uh, connected uh, with the Pennsylvania Railroad's middle division, which of course was sort of the main line of the, of the world, the standard railroad of the world. Uh, hundreds of trains a day passing through Mount Union that uh, could serve passengers, could serve uh, uh, the freight and, uh, business as well. So we'll take this tour, we'll start in Mount Union and then we'll head south down the line here, uh, ending up in Robertsdale. So the first slide here is a couple of pictures of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, and conveniently, these pictures with the, the PRR uh, mainline trains uh, also feature EBT equipment uh, next to them there. You can see in town there, the uh, EBT came up right beside the Pennsylvania mainline. So then in Mount Union, we talked about the cleaning plan a little bit. That's uh, shown here. Uh, the other two pictures, you can see they had a small engine facility, a stone uh, engine house that is still there uh, in Mount Union. And, and on the left side there, you can see it was a sizable yard. Hundreds of hoppers uh, could be held there to uh, await transfer uh, of their contents to uh, standard gauge cars. So then we leave Mount Union, head a little bit south to uh, one of the two primary uh, bridges on the railroad. Uh, and this first one is the Ogwick Creek Bridge, a concrete uh, arch structure still stands. Uh, however, uh, trains have not run across it since 1956. Uh, and then as we continue south, we end up in Orbizonia and Rock Hill. So Orbizonia Station, many of you may be familiar with if you've uh, been to the East Broad Top and ridden, this is the station where you bought your tickets uh, and rode the train from is uh, Orbizonia, uh, which is actually located in Rock Hill Furnace just across the creek. In Rock Hill, of course, was also the home to the shops of the, uh, of the railroad, where they could uh, maintain, build, uh, and, and do just about everything that the railroad needed. They were very self-sufficient um, with uh, maintaining the locomotives. They could cast new parts. The patterns uh, remain there to this day uh, to replace many of the parts on locomotives and cars. They even built uh, the lion's share of their steel cars, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And then Rock Hill was also a yard, uh, sorting yard. Most of the operations started out in Rock Hill each day. And so uh, cars would come here, sometimes be compiled. Uh, from Orbizonia North to Mount Union, the uh, grades were a little more gentle. Uh, and so oftentimes uh, trains could be uh, reassembled here in Rock Hill and uh, made longer to go to Mount Union or come back from Mount Union a little longer and then broken down here to head up the mountains to the mines. Uh, but some great pictures here. Uh, you can see the coal tipple uh, that was used to fuel the locomotives. And then uh, the picture on the upper right there is taken from the top of the coal tip at the south end of the yard uh, after operations had ceased. Okay, so leaving Rock Hill, the next big structure, the biggest bridge on the uh, original railroad is uh, another Ogwick Creek Bridge, but this is actually uh, common, more commonly referred to as Pogue. Uh, the little town of Pogue uh, is just at the uh, one end of the bridge. And so uh, Pogue, is uh, definitely a famous uh, low photo location. And uh, you can see it's a steel truss, worn truss structure. Okay. Heading south, we pass through several small towns, Three Springs and Saltillo, uh, small uh, typical stations and also uh, sites of um, 
some of the ganister quarries and things like that were in this region. Okay. We head up the mountains, uh, up into the mountain, up the broad top. Uh, we pass through two tunnels, Sidling Hill Tunnel, uh, which was a rock cut tunnel, as you can see, on a curve nonetheless. And then we uh, move a little further down the line and we pass through Ray's Hill Tunnel at Rocky Ridge, Rocky Ridge being the south end of the Ray's Hill Tunnel there, where you can see the Rocky Ridge branch took off uh, to the uh, northwest of the uh, main line. Okay. From Rocky Ridge now, uh, we uh, pass through a couple of small, more small towns and get to the uh, coal mining uh, center of Robertsdale. Robertsdale was sort of the southern hub of the railroad. Uh, uh, trains ran to Robertsdale and then started basically doing their switching. Uh, this was the last place to turn the train south of uh, uh, before uh, ending up in Woodvale and Alvin uh, at the mines. And so the little station on the right there still stands and actually the uh, building uh, in the bottom photo uh, is, was the post office in Robertsdale as well as some other things. Uh, and those two buildings still stand and uh, are actually owned now by the Friends of the East Broadtop. And uh, we uh, are in the midst of restoring and uh, maintaining those buildings. So, and building a museum in the uh, post office there at the bottom. So, okay. So we'll talk a little bit about equipment. <clears throat> very early on, of course, little 260s, little 280s later, uh, very small, very diminutive, uh, on the order of 10,000 pounds tractive effort uh, for narrow gauge, not the smallest, but certainly uh, uh, small by uh, standards of what you'll see next. Uh, so they went through a couple generations of locomotives. These were the little 260s. Uh, and then there were, like I said, heavier 280s. And then uh, shortly after the turn of the century, ended up with a, a Prairie, a 262 Baldwin built locomotive. Uh, and then we get into these 282s, which of course is what everybody knows and loves. 12 uh, was the first built in 1911. We'll hear a little bit more about these later. Uh, 14 and 15. Uh, built in 1912 and 1914, respectively. These were slightly bigger. They're kind of the medium uh, 282s on the railroad. And then the uh, third group built uh, uh, is number 16, 17, and 18. These were built between 1916 and, tw and 1920. Uh, and these were bigger still, uh, featured superheaters, uh, piston valve, southern valve gear, uh, several advances over the smaller uh, mics. But uh, one of the of these broad top is that all six of these Mikados still exist. And uh, four of them have operated since the railroad shut down in 1956. And we're hoping to see uh, uh, add a fifth to that here soon. But we'll let Brad and company talk about that. Okay. There were two standard gauge switchers on the railroad. Both of these exist in various states, uh, neither owned by the foundation uh, or the uh, uh, predecessor at this point, uh, but number three and number six, a uh, little standard gauge 060s. Uh, and oddly enough, I say little, but they were uh, actually the heaviest locomotives on the fleet being standard gauge 060s. Okay, then we uh, move on to motor cars. Uh, many people are familiar with the uh, M1. It's a uh, Brill slash Westinghouse slash EBT product. Uh, Brill provided the trucks and uh, operating gear essentially and uh, Westinghouse provided the electrical system, and East Broadtop pretty much built the rest. And this is a 1926 product, uh, of course, to uh, compensate uh, or to continue mail and passenger service even after mail service or passenger service had uh, declined uh, in the 20s and into the 30s uh, and still operates. In fact, I uh, just saw it moving on uh, Sunday, I believe. So uh, the little M3 there on the left, mostly a track. Uh, track crew kind of car, but uh, the Friends of the East Broadtop did some work on that, rebuilt it uh, uh, 15 years ago now, I believe, and uh, it is serviceable and uh, will likely be out. So, okay. And then I think we get into rolling stock. And so we start with the earliest cars, the wooden cars, uh, wooden hoppers for ore or for coal. Uh, and these ranged, you know, 10 tons, maybe 15 tons in later years, some of the larger wooden hoppers. Uh, obviously on uh, arch bar trucks and uh, even the little two, uh, two axle or jennies on the bottom there. Very early, very uh, um, uh, small compared to uh, modern uh, rail equipment. 
uh, and also operated with uh, Lincoln pin couplers and purely handbrakes, of course, in the 1870s and even into the uh, very early 20th century. Okay. And then we got modern. We get into the steel cars. Uh, and in the early 19 uh, teens, basically 1912 time frame, these broad top first pursued steel hoppers and they had a uh, press steel car company build 40 two bay hoppers that were all steel cars, very advanced. Uh, and that's one thing that uh, folks should understand. These broad top was actually a very advanced railroad for its time. Most standard gauge railroads hadn't bought into all steel cars yet in their early teens. Uh, and so very, very exciting. And not only could, did these broad top buy steel cars very early, but then shortly after that, they started duplicating them and they turn, turned out over 200 before 1920 uh, of entirely steel cars. So uh, the uh, teens were quite an advanced period uh, for the East Broad Top or an advancing period for the uh, East Broad Top. So they uh, didn't just build, build hoppers, of course. They did have box cars, flat cars, and even a tank car that were uh, pretty much all steel cars. The upper left car, car 170 there, is actually a hybrid. Uh, it looks like a wooden box car, and it certainly is a wooden box car on the outside, uh, but it's a steel frame car. So it has the structural integrity of a steel car, but the wood body uh, of a more classic car. Uh, upper right there is the more signature East Broad Top steel box cars that they, uh, they had uh, quite the fleet of. Uh, steel flat cars, also uh, 20 or so uh, of those were built. Uh, and all of these cars were basically built in the Orbizonia shops. Okay. Then I think we get into the two cabooses, also built in the uh, Rock Hill shops. Again, they're steel frame cars uh, with wooden bodies, classic uh, small cabooses. And both still survive and both are still uh, serviceable and operable. These coaches are the earlier coaches, sort of the first generation cars. Very simple, uh, obviously wood cars, wood frame, truss rod uh, support. Um, but uh, fairly bare bones, uh, and most of these are most of the first generation cars didn't survive uh, to the end. In the uh, teens, like I was saying, uh, we get into uh, some of the second hand cars. The uh, Boston Revere Beach and Lynn uh, was a commuter railroad in the Boston region that essentially went out of business in 1915, I believe. Uh, and in 1916, East Broadtop acquired a number of their cars, uh, which uh, some of you may be familiar with combines 14 and 15 pictured in the lower right. There is 15 um, came from the BRB and L and then also so did uh, coach eight, uh, nine, 10 and 11 coach eight, of course, still being on the uh, property in Rio Okay. And then uh, a few other notable cars here. Uh, 29 is the uh, baggage uh, express car. Uh, in the upper left there, that uh, is one of the two cars that the Friends of the East Broad Top uh, repatriated from Colorado about uh, 15 years ago, uh, and it awaits restoration in the uh, car shops. Uh, uh, business car 20, the President's car in the lower right, the Orbizonia, uh, is another fantastic car, uh, secondhand, and uh, is still on the property and uh, operates, uh, or I assume will operate uh, again soon. Okay, so that's the uh, very short vest pocket history. And I'll, I'll just say that the uh, railroad prospered uh, def definitely in the 20s. Like I said, peak coal year was 1920. Uh, the depression hit, things slowed a bit. There were some coal strikes. Uh, and then uh, eventually uh, World War II picked up. Then uh, in the 50s, the uh, coal business slowed drastically and the railroad eventually shut down uh, operations in 1956, April of 56. Uh, and uh, basically everybody shut off the lights, laid down their tools, and went home. And that's uh, kind of what you find today even, uh, is a place that's uh, just locked in time. Uh, and we'll tell more of the story here in a few minutes. Um, but if you want to know more of the history, the best book for that, the comprehensive book, is the book shown here, uh, The Rainy Kuiper East Broadtop. Uh, fantastic reading. Uh, it's out of print, unfortunately. But uh, it is still available. You can still find it uh, eBay or booksellers, uh, and even a few copies occasionally show up on the uh, uh, through like the FEBT company store uh, when we find copies. So, uh, so Scarlett, uh, let me ask: Are there questions on the history that uh, we should uh, cover? So, it, yeah, if anyone does have questions on the history, go ahead and keep submitting those. In the meantime, Andy, what you mentioned that the uh, industry had been 
pretty much closed down by the late, by 56. What was the last industry that the railroad serviced? Well, essentially the uh, railroad ended with coal. Uh, literally the last run was pretty much moving coal, the remaining coal on the line into Mount Union. And then uh, the last actual operation of the railroad was, uh, I believe, switcher number three, moving those hoppers into the washing plant and unloading that coal. Thank you, Andy, for a great overview of the East Broadtop Railroad. Thanks also to Lee Rainey for his historical research and the use of his materials, and to Ann Mason and Gary Goldsmith, who provided the technical support that made this program possible. Join us for part two of East Broadtop Railroad then and now to hear more from Andy and the new East Broadtop management team about preservation efforts and future plans.